Cannabis Common Sense, the show that tells the truth about marijuana and the politics behind its prohibition. Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of Cannabis Common Sense. This week's guest is an old friend, Paul Richmond. We'll be talking to him a little bit later. We have an interesting hip news segment for you tonight, recent court ruling. And uh, as always, we'll start off with our infamous dancing, Cannabis Leaves. I feel the force. Okay, our first story tonight is from the U.S. Federal Court of Appeals has rejected a federal gun ban for marijuana consumers. Another federal court has ruled that long-standing federal restrictions prohibiting marijuana users from possessing firearms are unconstitutional. Last Wednesday, a three-judge panel of the New Orleans-based Fifth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals ruled that a 1968 law prohibiting the possession or sale of a firearm to an unlawful user of a federally controlled substance should not be applied so broadly that it would criminalize all gun owners with a prior history of marijuana use. The federal court case is the United States versus Daniels. The case in question involved a man sentenced to four years in prison after police found firearms and marijuana cigarette butts in his vehicle. Although the defendant acknowledged that he had occasionally smoked marijuana, prosecutors presented no evidence to imply that he was under the influence of cannabis at the time of his arrest. The uh, federal justices opined, quote, throughout American history, laws have regulated the combination of guns and intoxicating substances, but at no point in the 18th or 19th century did the government disarm individuals who used drugs or alcohol at one time from possessing guns at another. In short, our history and tradition may support some limits on an intoxicated person's right to carry a weapon, but it does not justify disarming a sober citizen based exclusively on their past drug usage, nor do more generalized traditions of disarming dangerous persons support the restrictions on nonviolent drug users." End quote. The decision comes months after a federal judge for the U.S. District Court of the Western District of Oklahoma similarly ruled that, quote, the mere status of a user of marijuana, end quote, does not justify the federal government stripping the defendant of his fundamental right to possess a firearm. A judge for the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas also issued a similar decision in April. Federal courts are wisely deciding time and again that the simple use of cannabis should not preclude someone from the legal protections afforded to all Americans by the U.S. Constitution. Unfortunately, these rulings are not universally applicable or binding. Either the U.S. Supreme Court or Congress need to make this law uh, the law of the land before any more responsible cannabis consumers are threatened with lengthy prison terms simply for exercising their constitutional right. A separate legal challenge to the federal government's interpretation of the 1968 law, initially brought by former Florida Agriculture Commissioner Nikki Fried and several medical cannabis patients, remains pending in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit. The court's expected to hear arguments in the case in October. Earlier this year, congressional lawmakers introduced a pair of bills that seek to remove federal firearms-related restrictions on individuals who consume cannabis. In a brief filed on Friday, the Justice Department informed a federal appeals court that it believes a separate court's recent ruling that the federal ban on, owning, on cannabis consumers owning or possessing firearms as unconstitutional was incorrectly decided, end quote. Uh, the, U the Department of Justice shared its opinion with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit while preparing for another lawsuit related to the gun ban for cannabis consumers. 
the uh, decision in question, which was announced last week by the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit, marked the latest in a string of victories for advocates seeking to normalize gun ownership for cannabis consumers. District courts have also ruled that the ban on cannabis consumers owning guns violates the Second and the Fifth uh, um, violates the Second Amendment. But the Fifth Circuit's most powerful court decision yet to reach that decision. According to the report, legal arguments for ending the ban generally hinge on a 2022 Supreme Court ruling that found restrictions on firearms must be consistent with the historical context of the Second Amendment. If the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit were to uphold gun ownership bans, contradicting the decision by the Fifth Circuit, it could set the stage for the Supreme Court to intervene. In Washington State, state launches at a online reimbursement portal for those with past marijuana convictions. Washington state officials are set to begin providing financial reimbursements to hundreds of thousands of residents with prior convictions for the possession of marijuana and other controlled substances. In 2021, the Washington Supreme Court determined that the legal statutes that criminalized drug possession were unconstitutional and void because they did not require intent or knowledge of possession, a due process violation both state and federal constitutions. As a result of this decision, known as State versus Blake, any Washington State Blake-related convictions qualify to be vacated and removed from one's criminal record, and any legal financial obligations paid as a result qualify for financial reimbursement. According to the July 31st press release issued by Washington's Administrative Office of Courts, Quote, the state versus Blake ruling impacts an estimated 200,000 plus felony drug possession charges dating back to the 1970s and an estimated additional 125,000 misdemeanor marijuana charges eligible, eligible for vacation. End quote. State officials have set aside nearly $100 million to reimburse fines, court costs, and legal fees associated with these past convictions and they've launched a web portal where eligible parties may apply for refunds. Uh, quote, the intent of the new website is to have a process that's easy to navigate and will provide for a timely response for individuals to receive their refunds. End quote, said Sharon Swanson, the Blake Implementation Officer for Washington State's Administrative Office of the Courts. Quote, the public will be able to search for their case by their name or case number. End quote. The homepage of the website reads, if you have a Blake impacted criminal record, you must first have your Blake related convictions vacated and a refund eligibility determined by the Washington State County or court where you were convicted. Once you've vacated your conviction and found your record online, you're ready to apply for your legal financial obligation refund online or by mail, end quote. In 2019, Democratic Governor Jay Inslee signed legislation into law stating, quote, every person convicted of misdemeanor marijuana offenses who was 21 years of age or older at the time of the offense may apply to the sentencing court for a vacation of the applicant's record of conviction for the offense. If the applicant qualifies under the subsection, the court shall vacate the record of conviction, end quote. Washington's legalized adult use marijuana possession passed in 20. Well, further information is available online from Washington Court's Blake Refund Bureau. A growing percentage of Americans acknowledge that cannabis smoke exposure poses fewer risks to health than does tobacco, according to survey data published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. Researchers surveyed over 5,000 respondents on their views regarding smoking. 43% of respondents perceived the daily smoking of one cannabis cigarette to be either much safer or somewhat safer than the daily use of tobacco cigarettes, up from 36% in 2017. About 30% of respondents viewed the two products as equally dangerous to health. Younger respondents were most likely to have shifted their views over time, whereas retirees were least likely to have done so. 41% of respondents perceived exposure to secondhand marijuana smoke to be either much safer or somewhat safer than tobacco smoke up from 35% in 2017. The full text of this study, Perceptions of Safety of Daily Cannabis versus Tobacco Smoking and Secondhand Smoke Exposure, appears online in the Journal of the American Medical Association. 
Our last story tonight, out of Tel Aviv, Israel. Patients diagnosed with dystonia are the involuntary muscle contractions and spasms report experiencing therapeutic benefit from smoking cannabis, according to data published in the Journal for Frontiers of Neurology. Uh, Israeli researchers surveyed 23 dystonia patients authorized to use medical cannabis. Cannabis is legal in certain circumstances in Israel under a doctor's supervision. Participants in the study had used cannabis on average a period of nearly three years and all reported benefit. That's the end of our hemp news segment tonight. Uh, if you are a loved one or looking for help finding a doctor who can help you get a medical marijuana permit, give us a call. We have a, a referral service, so call us at 503 235 4606. That's 503 235 4606. Thanks for watching and help restore hemp. I would like to welcome on our show, Paul Richmond. Paul is a longtime pioneer in Portland's community cable access and print media. He used to work for PDXS as well and write articles, or at least write articles in there, and then went to law school in University of Washington and has been practicing law for, is it 20 years now, Paul? A little bit over 20, yeah. Yeah, mainly up in Port Angeles, but across Washington State primarily, right? I'm in Bellingham presently, but yeah, across Washington State. Okay, a little bit bigger. So you were and still are active. I know you recently had, a, or maybe not so recently, had a case revolving around uh, people getting stopped near the border and being found with medical cannabis. Do you want to tell our audience about that? Well, that was actually 2008. It was actually sort of a precursor to the Holder Memorandum, but I was one of the first. It was one of the first cases uh, brought actually during the Bush administration back then. Um, I represented a disabled veteran who was maybe about uh, 140 pounds wet with his wooden leg, and uh, multiple spinal surgeries and. The police at that, well, it was the Border Patrol at that, Customs and Border Patrol at that time, were setting up um, checkpoints all around the Olympic Peninsula and stopping people, saying that anywhere within 100 miles is a border. And um, we had literally tens of thousands of people stopped at that point. I represented one of the first people who was criminally charged, again, disabled vet, they, after sniffing, spending about an hour sniffing around on him, they found uh, one marijuana cigarette that he kind of showed them, and they charged him criminally down in Tacoma. Um, I got the- That's a lot of the border. Yeah, well, they were saying that anywhere within 100 miles of the border is a, is a border. Uh, what happened, I think, after uh, September 11th, 2001, is you just had this huge influx of money to um, fight so terrorism, and everyone was just kind of like grabbing up, trying to um, reach grab whatever money they could. I was in the Olympic Peninsula then, so that's where I think why you probably thought Port Angeles is in Port Townsend. But, um, oh, yeah, I always do this. They're both on the Olympic Peninsula. Um, North they, of it, both. They're on the Strait of Juan de Fuca. They'd had maybe about four Border Patrol officers before September 11th. And they moved it up to almost four, I think a little bit less than 40 after the infusion of funds. And there was nothing for them to do. So they were, they were I think, trying to... Um, as happens in a lot of these out of the way areas, they set up these programs or they try, they sort of try out programs before they try them on a national scale. Sort of the same way you'll see, you know, the, a company may test market a new detergent or a new coffee in sort of an out of the way area and then see how it flies and then play with it there. They do the same with thing with policy. They were doing that very actively with Portland when I was active there in the 90s. Um, 
<clears throat> I can, we can touch on that. But in this case, they we're trying out this program where they were setting up checkpoints for the border patrol um, and saying that everywhere that within 100 miles of a border. And if you figure that out, that's about three fifths or so of the population of the United States, then they could be stopping randomly. And I picked up the case on uh, Friday and had no idea what I was doing and wrote some um, to some listservs, uh, just saying uh, any of you people know what to do. Uh, a couple of people joined in. The, le the late Jeffrey Steinborn among them gave me a lot of help on that. Um, and I spent the weekend just sort of figuring out what I'd gotten, wrote a letter to the Border Patrol who, um, or the U.S. Attorney um, who I happen to know from another political case on Monday, Tuesday was Veterans Day. We show up in court Wednesday, find out that our case is dismissed, go home and find out that every um, case that the U.S. attorney that has been brought has been dismissed by the U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney has written a letter to the Border Patrol saying, um, um, if you're going to be prosecuting these sort of actions, you uh, the, for and this was a medical marijuana case, um, you you better find um, you're going to have to do it yourself. We're not going to prosecute it. And the language that they sent was then later used in the Holder Memorandum on medical marijuana. So this was like in the waning years of the Bush administration. So. Um, I, I describe it as throwing it. I was just trying to solve the uh, criminal case and I ended up actually stopping the whole program. I describe it as throwing a Nerf ball at the opponent and hitting the air duct on the Death Star. And the, uh, just, the whole thing just collapses. I'm like, what? I did that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it's, I think. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's, I, I, I think, you know, sort of of the attorney who did Roe v. Wade, what she had said is, you know, I, I wasn't like this really the best lawyer or anything I was the one who was willing to do it and just pretty much anyone who was willing to do it in that time could have done it and I just happened I think that's that's been sort of a lot of my success in activism has just been the willingness to actually go out there and do that and I, I find that often is, is the game changer um, yeah I know when I first met you you were deeply involved in activism here in Portland. And uh, you want to tell us how you became active in, in being an activist before you became a lawyer? And <laughs> Oh, long. Uh, you have us on, oh, on Portland table access as well? Yeah, I was uh, producing uh, shows on Portland cable access. Uh, now it's at, called it's gone through a few name changes, but is now it's open. Open media. Uh, open signal PCM, I think. Well, I'm glad it's still around. Um, you know, yeah, they took they took nice. they took it away in Seattle a couple of a number of years ago. We don't have any. Uh, Portland, for whatever reason, had like the uh, most one of the most advanced, uh, most robust public access systems in the country, if not the world, when I got there. And I had been a graduate of film school, um, was going to be making these idealistic statements and learned that Top Gun had started as something of an anti-war statement and uh, Fatal Attraction had started as a statement how men needed to get re be more responsible in relationships. And if you see how those films turned out, it kind of gave that and a few other things gave me the uh, inkling that, you know, if I stay around in Hollywood, it's to try and get, it's really not going to work out that way. Um, and bounced around and what, lived in Portland and I'm sorry. What film school did you go to? I believe it or not have a bachelor's of Calif a bachelor's in film and video from California into the arts. That's the school that the Disney studio set up. And then I have a master's degree from the American film Institute. That's the, School at the Motion Picture Academy. I, so I, I think I'm literally the only lawyer in the world with those two degrees, uh, <laughs> which made it made it the application to law school interesting, as well because I had no GPA, but I managed to pull that out. Um, they liked, I guess, for aspiring activists, 
they liked what I had done. I'll put it that way. I, I had no GPA. In there. Um, I went to Evergreen State College, and we didn't have a GPA either. But we had an outrageously good acceptance rate in the law school and medical school. That's great to know. That's great to know. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. But uh, so you, you came to Portland and, and got involved in public community media. And yeah. You were also writing for Jim Redden's newspaper, PDXS. I remember you wrote an article about me in particular <laughs> that was a pretty long article. Uh, I think it was called, Who is Paul Stanford? And why are these people saying these horrible things about him? There it is. <laughs> you gotta, you, maybe you can take a picture or scan that for me. I, I have lost track of, of that. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, going so, into, I think, sort of the way you were getting kind of, I think, set up and yeah, the issues. and harassed. You know, and maybe it's not. What year? When was that published? What was the year on that? June fourteenth, ninety six. That's what I see. Yeah. So that the, I had been harassed for several years at that point by a fellow who was some sort of federal agent, and believe it or not, that guy is still harassing me here, thirty years later. I mean, I've been stalked by this federal informant whatever it is or uh since like 94 or something do we know that he's actually uh federal has that been shown anywhere i'm not sure no i don't know that i just know who he is and you know we could probably talk about this off camera at some point but uh um uh, yeah it's still continuing yeah, sorry to hear that. Um, yeah. There was a lot of... Um, a lot that of that I was convicted of growing marijuana in 1993. I think that was it. I, I got acquitted, you know, of growing and found guilty of simple possession of marijuana in federal court here in 1993. And, you know, I was found guilty just of possession of a couple of grams of marijuana. and. Just this year, I got a pardon from President Biden on nice. the simple federal possession conviction involved in that. But uh, someone involved with that uh, who was doing all those terrible things all those years ago is still doing pretty terrible things. Well, it's, it's I guess it's the price of being an activist or, or, or pushing off the wrong person. Well, yeah, I mean... It's yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, it's it almost seems like yeah. Um, our our director, who's who helps record this, he and my other partners would get phone calls from this guy where it looked like I was calling them, or it looked like someone else was calling them, and they call my house. It's recently called my wife and harassed her too. Well, it's and uh, might be grounds for an anti-harassment order on that, but that's yeah. uh, I have law. I had the mic and the information to go after him, but I've got more stories about that. How, you know, I hired a private investigator to serve him a cease and desist order. Private investigator came back to me and lied to me, and uh, I won't go into those details at this time. Let's get back to you. What about that article in particular? What, is there anything in, that you can remember about that situation in in the mid nineties? Oh, there there was some. I, I'm thinking back to you know, sort of what got me started, and one of the things that started is between Portland and L.A. I lived in Humboldt County, mm -hmm. and I got to see the effects that you know that was like a depressed area that was had a lot of. Um, uh, people who were timber workers didn't have anything left. Uh, a lot of um, a lot of just a lot of people who were, frankly, probably now would be like MAGA heads who were growing pot. <laughs> and uh, it, it was the only way they could like hold on to their property. And there would be people, uh, you know, camp. The uh, they would come in with helicopters. 
uh, M16s yeah. hold people at gunpoint. And it was one yeah, of the things yeah. I think really, one of the things I sort of became very aware, cognizant of and aware of in my time in Portland was the militarization of law enforcement. Apparently, some of the writing I did at the time in the other newspapers, starting with the Portlandian, and is now cited as like the some of the first writing to ever use the phrase militarization of law enforcement. Um, you know, right place at the right time. Portland was really always has been sort of like a testing area. If you remember, Vera Katz at the time had something called the, and um, the legislature had something called the Oregon Option, which was um, in the uh, early, 90, early 90s, where they um, were literally using Oregon as a test area for a lot of policies. Um, if you look at the way that Oregon was founded, you had a lot of money from outside the area. So if you're, you look at the way the country was founded, um, you look at maybe at the railroads, and the railroads weren't just like were uh, weren't just the the, ra the trains. They were like being granted huge areas of land. So that's why like all these timber companies ha have all the uh, names like Louisiana Pacific, Georgia Pacific, and then behind them you have like these banks and holding companies. So the money is still there in that same sort of organization. And most of the money that's controlling the state of Oregon or directing the state of Oregon is from out of the area and coming up plans. So you had them meeting um, with think tanks, first with some of the wealthy individuals, and then they would take their policies and they'd try and implement it in policy. And in the early 90s, of course, um, we had a Democratic president and um, a Democratic legislature, Democratic governor, Democratic mayor in the major city. Um, it's not that these programs were all, all Democratic. They were run by Democrats and Republicans, but the Democrats are going to play their side. And so Oregon became a test area where a lot of um, these new programs were tried out. Um, uh, notably, one of the things that started out was um, uh, the militarization of law enforcement. A lot of that had started in Portland um, under the rubric of this very friendly start sounding term called community policing. You know, everyone said, oh, wow, that sounds really nice. They get, get the communities. Well, every, what, what turned out in the 90s was everyone who started out as uh, a lieutenant in star charge of the community policing then got transferred to become head of tactical operations, tactical operations with our SWAT team. And during that time, they were the ones who'd come in, knock down the doors, seize all the property. So you have officer friendly coming in there learning about it. And I think the, uh, some of the people I, I traced, uh, Mark Parisi, Greg Clark started as lieutenant, went on to become captain of tactical operations in the Portland Police Bureau. And um, one of the ways they then exported this nationally is, when, is through the 1995 crime bill, ironically through, um, I guess, our pre current president, uh, Joe Biden, was one of the um, architects of it. But one of the things it talked about was 100,000 new cops on the street. Well, if you look, if you read the fine print, what those were, were those were mostly SWAT cops. And the way that they were funding those was asset forfeiture. So what it was doing was it basically was setting these militarized cops out on the street. Um, and then they'd get in there and they'd seize property and then they'd Basically, it was, it was revenue enhancement, and it created um, a uh, incentive for them to basically find find things that were wrong. And they would, you know, tend to go after people doing pot uh, as opposed to someone doing crack. If someone's got crack doing crack, usually doesn't have much. Right. They were after the forfeiture. They're exactly. It was all asset forfeiture driven. And so I heard they actually would search and see if someone owned their house and how much equity they had before they would go in. And I've heard of other cases where one fellow, they took everything, even his refrigerator, and he committed suicide. You know, it's. Uh, anyway, and and a lot again, they were try really taking a lot of the program that was in Portland and exporting it nationally. Two of the three finalists for uh, that position were Tom Potter and Charles Moose, who were former police chiefs. Uh, Moose, I guess, yeah. recently deceased. 
I believe the position eventually went to Gil Kurlikowski, who then came back and became uh, chief of police in Seattle. So again, that Northwest connection and rubric kind of going in there. And then he went on to head the, uh, I think, head the Border Patrol. Um, but um, other things that were going on there, um, you had a lot of, uh, I think there was at that time, you also had the ADL spy scandal take place, if you remember that, where they were gathering names and information on activists. Um, it was uh, through the ADL fact-finding division, and a lot of it was um, done through uh, the criminal intelligence division of the Poli Portland Police Bureau. Um, you know, you know, and they were taking, getting, I think they'd gotten information, they suppose they'd gotten information on tens of thousands of activists and were sending it to foreign co governments and getting people killed. And um, that was sort of an episode that actually convinced me of just how, sometimes how poorly organized a lot of these programs are. Um, I, I, um, <laughs> decided I wanted to try and find out who who was actually in this criminal intelligence division of the Portland Police Bureau. So at that time, you could actually go into the building, and I went up and went to the floor where the uh, head of the criminal intelligence or the desk person for the criminal intelligence division was. I started saying, you know, I'd like to know if I could find out the names of all the people in this because I think there's sort of an interest a public interest in it and it's like well you know you'll have to go through da, 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 and start giving all this rigmarole and behind him he, he, I think he's completely forgotten about it is this duty roster board which has all their names and their phone numbers <laughs> I'm just like asking the guy I'm just playing the game back at him and I'm just like asking the same question and I'm not even sure what I'm asking but I'm writing stuff down. <laughs> down those names and stuff off the duty board. All right. And then, you know, I'm like, okay, this cannot be this easy. This cannot be this easy. I go out, go into the elevator. These guys are going to jump me on the way out. Get out the bed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't. They probably didn't. They didn't notice it, though, apparently, at the time. We published We're, it in uh, the Portlandian. I think we had like a print run of about right. 20,000 copies. <laughs> um, I, did you have any feedback on it? Um, if you remember Douglas Squirrel, who was, the, who like gathered a lot of, got a lot of like pro bono lawyers for activists who were arrested. He was eventually set up and arrested. And one of his, his officer, his, um, I'm sorry, his lawyer was asking one of the officers if, about the criminal intelligence division, and they said fame things, so things just read off the the list from that article. So you've seen this article? No. What's this? And the guy's just face goes white, jaw chops the ground. Um, no. But yeah, no. So um, another thing that was going on during the um, commu whole community policing thing was that also. Um, to get all these new cops on the street, they were hiring a lot more. And so the training standards went down. Um, they were also, um, I think, training them to be much more aggressive and to see threats much more. Um, uh, in, in very mundane things. Um, and so what happened, one of the things that happened is that the... Um, killing rate just went way up. Um, our, our, I mentioned our special emergency response team. I think it grew from like two to about 56 officers in the space of about two and a half years. You know, like an increase mm -hmm. of 2,800%. So the SWAT team grows in that period. That's, that's again, horrendous growth and out yeah. of proportion. At the same time, the actual numbers of cops on the street in proportion to the population actually dropped. So there were less beat cops. But that was what community was giving us. The, yeah, the SWAT teams had these military armored vehicles that somehow they allocated from the army. And they were used those during some of their drug raids. In some cases, to knock doors down. I remember, and I can't remember the details clearly, but perhaps you do. 
where uh, they there was one fellow in particular who had said they weren't going to come and take him alive. And he he killed a lady that was coming in the door, one a late uh, female police officer. And they shot him and he was paralyzed. But they took his nude body and stretched it across the top of the armored vehicle and took it like a trophy down the block. And this photo with these, this guy's paralyzed, he's naked, laying on the hood of this, like a tank. And the police are on both sides of the vehicle with their, ar their, their, their rifles pointed out. There's like a bunch of them protect, you know. But then once they took him to jail, uh, somehow the camera in his cell went out and he, even though he was paralyzed, he hung himself from his bed. Uh, kind of like the, the Jeffrey Epstein case recently. Oh, yeah. the camera's gone out and, uh, oops. And, oh, I'm, but Epstein wasn't paralyzed the way this guy was. But you remember that case, I'm sure. I remember, I do remember those details. I'm, I'm blanking on the fellow's, the poor fellow's name, but yeah, it was, I mean, and they, the media at the time were just, you know, making heroes of everyone, uh, the police involved. And it was, it really, I think, was, was always a shame. The media, I think, was very much into, really felt like it was compelled to, give the police their version of things or they would stop getting leads. And so you never saw, you never at least initially would see critical um, uh, coverage of the police. I was, I knew enough that I could pre present things credibly and I often would like punch windows. So then the other media would kind of follow in. There was, I remember the one back when the, Sunday edition of the Oregonian was something substantial. I remember one edition of it where like every <laughs> section of it was a story that I had broken. And I was like, I joked with Jim Redden at the, at, then at PDX, you know, maybe they should just hire me outright. <laughs> well, they've laid off almost everybody now, right? Have we they, just get the corporate line. I don't, I haven't been following the Oregonian that, or, or I, I, I confess I've, been removed from Oregon uh, so I for so long. Yeah. 20 plus years. When did you first go to law school? I can't. I remember when you left town to go to law school at the University of Washington. And I figured I'd sort of take a break from activism. And what happened was that the WTO followed me up there. So after right. the first year, Here. I ended up setting up these. I found I identified professors who liked the work I'd been doing enough that I was able to set up clinics. So I set up the National Lawyers Guild Legal Observer Program there and was, did, was a large part of setting up the independent media center that chronicled a lot of the events starting that going. Um, we had, had a couple of hundred legal observers in the street, uh, lots of videographers, but that was one of the first um, real mass efforts to just swarm the police and swarm what was going on and capture it and get it out, which we've done in Portland as well. But um, yeah, so- You I'm had a, just, global, a global issue, so global audience around that. So what year did you first, when did you leave Portland? That would have been 98. 98, okay. 98, and it started, went to law school 98 to 2001. Um, 99 being when the WTO was there and um, the report, um, there's a number of the reports I wrote online, uh, waging war on dissent, um, uh, bringing an undemocratic institution brings an undemocratic response. I can provide links to those as well. Um, I also yeah. have done some analysis in, in PDXS and the Portlandian of how, as well as the TV shows, as to how the Oregon option and the corporations had come in and um, just basically set up all these programs that were test marketing these policies in Oregon. How did I initially get that information? I learned a little bit about it and I called the organizations involved. And then I said, you know, I'm, I 
presented myself as a journalist. I said, you know, I think people should know a little bit more about this. And I'd like to help get the information out. Um, mm -hmm. And so they sent me a large box of documents that I spent a few years going through. But that's that was what started me on it. Usually the best source of the information on a lot of these organizations is themselves. Um, you know, going for corporations, you go through the public records reports or go through the corporate filings or the press releases. Uh, often the same with um, uh, law enforcement. But a lot of the um, government documents are, are readily, still readily available and free. And, uh, you know, it, it probably even more so now with the internet. Yeah. I couldn't have dreamed. Yeah. I mean, I it's, just, it's a lot easier to do research now. Yeah, but if things are outside of the internet, it's more difficult, I guess. They, there's not a lot that gets up to the top of the search engines. Yeah, it's well, it's knowing where to go to, and you know, um, not just the search engines, but you know, going to the organizations themselves. I mean, often they they have you know, they have some of a vested interest in at least keeping their own. Um, followings apprised of what they're doing. Weren't you involved with the Seattle Hemp Fest in some way? Um, I've spoken at it a few times. Yeah, I have uh, friends with Vivian McPeak. Um, I, um, they had me, I think, when I was a candidate at, for Congress at one point, and uh, um, I've spoken about, um, I've spoken about the militarization of law enforcement in that context. Um, so, yeah, um, I, I, I think that was like my main, um, you know, connection. I've done things I, like I think with some of the rallies you put on getting permits and helping uh, at least uh, minimize or um, keep the uh, keep keep a lid on things so that they, the police don't shut it down or the police are kind of contained somewhat. Yeah. I, I knew you had some involvement in that aspect of it. It's always helpful. We always, we we organizers of these kinds of things always appreciate that. So these days you're practicing in Bellingham. That's right at the side of the the naval sub base, isn't it? Uh, that's Bangor in but Bremerton. Yeah. I'm sorry. You're up near the Canada border, though, the uh, on I-5. Is that right? Right. I'm just. I was uh, Bellevue and Bellingham confused. Excuse me. Yeah. Or not Bellevue, but yeah, the sub base. <laughs> yeah, um, the sub base is sub base is in Bremerton, which is across the Bremerton. water from uh, Seattle. So we're a yeah. bit way ways over. Um, um, I guess I've got an escape hatch if the country goes completely being right below Canada. Yeah. Uh, I see some of your videos you post in the wild with waterfalls and rivers. I knew you were still in the sound somewhere. Yeah. So what does your practice consist of these days? Um, at this st stage, um, I've been um, playing catch up and making a living as a lot of it. Uh, so a lot of family law, um, some consumer, uh, a lot of what I saw rise tremendously during um, COVID was the amount of domestic violence. And that was just horrific to see that. And so I've, I've gotten into you know, trying to help the victims with that or at least you know, get the perpetrators to acknowledge that, you know, make a change which but those are kind of more unicorn cases as last ones, unfortunately but yeah i mean in general what i've noticed since um covid is just you know much more of uh i think people are much more on edge i think there's in general been much more of a stratification of society and i see that here in bellingham um it used to be a much more i'm sorry Citizens United changing the political structure to some degree and uh, the further centralization of wealth. You know, it's it's uh, uh, made it a lot more volatile and the whole MAGA movement. 
uh, you being near the border, I guess, then do you have any border issues with uh, people crossing from Canada to the U.S.? Um, I, I cross fairly regularly for personal reasons, but um, and even was able to figure out uh, able to do it a bit around COVID. But um, what I notice in the general area is that the the, um, the way the housing has just gotten things have just gotten so much more expensive, especially for the generation that's coming up. Um, the uh, cost of going to school is just even I mean, it's not that long ago that I got out of law school. And um, at that time, UW had a um, in-state tuition of about five grand. I mean, you could you could do that and you could get in and credibly have a shot at doing the sort of work that you wanted to without a lot of debt come over your back. Um, that's one of the things I, I always tell aspiring lawyers is, you know, pick the law. I think Jerry Spence had that this in his book uh, with Justice for None, pick the law school that costs the least and look at the, look at the amount of debt because they will, uh, a lot of the re way that law school is set up is that I, I it's, um, it really does, I think, serve less to teach you how to actually practice law than it does to serve as a form of culturation, um, indoctrination, as you were. Um, most of what's taught in law school, I, I, and most of the people that spoke, spoke to my class would informally agree, could be learned in about six months, not three years. Um, before we had law schools, um, the way you would learn was you would basically apprentice uh, you and just sort of set up a prat shingle and just learn as you were going. And if you did it that way, you'd actually set up ties with your community and you know the law. What happened, or it changed around 1870, what happened there? You get back to the same thing I talked about before with the railroads. You had these power structures coming into the town trying to gobble everything up. The last thing they want is someone who knows the law who's going to be able to stand with the people and keep them from gobbling everything up. So the system got changed they, and they changed a lot of, they changed medical field too at this time from uh, a lot, got rid of a lot of the alternative medicine, but in um, law, they changed it so that um, you basically had to go to this system where they were, um, they didn't teach you how to practice they just they enculturated you um they give you a they give you a lot of questions and they don't give you a lot of answers um it made a lot of sense to me when i was sitting in on the orientation on the second year class mm -hmm. and i had also well uh, while that was going on i happened to flip channels and catch this documentary and cult indoctrination techniques on pbs and they're talking about how in uh, cults, what they will do is they will cut you off from everyone you know, and they will isolate you from your friends, and they will make you work inordinate hours, go without adequate food, go without adequate sleep. And then I'm hearing them talk to these new bright-eyed young kids saying, oh, you know, now, though, now you want to say, those of you in relationships, most of you are going to not be in them by the time you get out, and you're going to want to say goodbye to your friends because you're not going to see them, and you're not going to be sleeping very well, and on and on, you know, just like check out the boxes. And then at the yeah. end, and then, you know, at the end of three years, and then what they, I learned in a cult is at the end of uh, a period, usually about three years, you will be uh, initiated into the higher ranks and you will be given magical powers. Mm -hmm. Natural powers. And, and the dean is coming on and saying, now it will all be worth it because at the end of three years, you will be a lawyer and people will look up to you and people will respect you. I'm like, bang, that's it. Right, um, right. The clerkship, there is still a few um, states, Washington being one of them, that does allow people to uh, go through apprenticeship and go to learn to practice law to uh, through uh, without going to law school. Uh, it's much more 
civilized way of doing it in a lot of ways, particularly for someone with a lower income um, or who doesn't. Are there that, you know, people, or lawyers who, you know, people who have done that and got sure. past the bar exam? And sure, sure. The bar exam isn't that hard. Um, I mean, and there are classes for to take help you take the bar exam. Um, I think our, ours in Washington is a little bit different than most of the other states, but it's not impossible. And you get to uh, one of the things is you pretty much get to take it as many times as you want until you pass. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. So that's it's yeah. If you're persistent, it will eventually pay. I hear that most people don't pass it on the first go, but uh... it varies. I mean, different states have different passage rates, um, depending on how. Um, I think California has a fairly low passage rate. Um, Washington, the last I checked, it was a little. It was more than half first time around. Let me digress a bit. Do you, are there any of your videos out? I I didn't realize your background in, in with a master's from the American Film Institute. I don't know how I. If I ever knew that, I forgot it. But uh, uh, have you have? Are there any things on YouTube or anything we can point viewers to? Um, I have. I don't have a lot on YouTube. Um, my master's was in screenwriting, actually, at uh, AFI, and then I did. Um, you know, at this point, most of what I had done in school is it's fairly primitive by today's standards, but good and good at its time. Um, well, right. Was that definitely uh, an important factor in law school? I eh? yes, if you can you can write a screen, and you obviously had a number of publishing uh, ties and articles and research here and, in terms of. And they liked, I think, that I had actually been able to um, get a lot of uh, laws actually modified and changed. Um, you know. Um, Public access at the time was, I mean, this was before the internet. So um, really TV was kind of the only game in town. And you had public access facilities in Portland. There was one in out in Mount Hood. There was one downtown uh, across the river. There's still one. There was one in there Tualatin. Four here. I'm sorry? You know, they... In fact, they continue to upgrade those studios. They they close them down periodically. We have one. It moved out of Mount Hood Community College, and it's in downtown Gresham. We have one still in the same place there in Beaverton, one at Clackamas County Community College, and then the, the one I've been working out of since 1996 with this show uh, we is the Portland one, just off the same location. And that's a huge studio. And uh, they keep upgrading the equipment. That's great. Every few years. That's great. It's not much anymore, I'm sorry. unfortunately. So you aspiring filmmakers out there are, are there, there's a resource, and oh, the classes are cheap. It's huge, and you get an audience too. Um, I, I by they would show each of my shows. Um, a minimum of three to six times a week on each facility. You could take a show that you shot on one facility, bicycle it to the other show, other facilities, and get another bunch of airplays out of it. And by running the tapes around, you, I was probably getting somewhere in the average of 20 to 40 hours of aired programming a week. And so that way I was able to actually force a lot of issues to get covered. So um, like I helped shut down a police precinct that had one of the highest per capita rate shooting kit rates in the country. I helped um, end a pilot program that had the National Guard accompanying police on drug raids. Um, I think I probably helped get Tom Potter out of office, uh, uh, helped get a friend into the Senate, um, helped stop clear cutting in Portland's watershed, the Bull Run. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, stuff that seems amazing, but it was, it was there and it was just, uh, I, what I found was one of the, one of the tricks was, um, the media was like really into, um, 
or the trying to doing these quick things and sound bites and slickness. What's missing there? Depth. And what can't they match you on? Depth. So we do these programs that were, you know, we couldn't match them for their slickness, but we could get a hell of a lot more information in. And we could show a lot more real stuff. And so they realized that they couldn't really match us there. We played to our played to the suit that they couldn't touch. And that got us, I think that got us a lot of recognition and a lot of a lot of the media were actually like watching our, sh our shows. It was, it was kind of interesting. And then, you know, you could, uh, the, using the articles we were putting out in the newspapers in tandem, we, you know, then you could have something sitting out there in the community for, you know, a month or a week or whatever, but it's there for someone to physically pick up. Right. So we're, we're probably to the show now. Is there anything you want to talk about in terms of the future or things you're going to work on or you're going to put out the great American novel or anything? I'm, you know, if I can help, I'm looking to uh, part of, you know, as I think as we get older, we also sort of look for people to carry on and uh, yeah. pass the torch. It's It's been nice to see the way that, it, you know, when I left Access, so many of the people like you have you know, kind of kept up going what, what started that's nice um uh you know i've got people in my office i'm trying to train to become lawyers and i sort of that's one of the things i kind of look for is people who are sort of idealistic and wanting to um you know make a difference so you can maybe put them in a position that they might not be able to maybe give them a little bit more of a leg up than they might have otherwise have so that they can do that um if um yeah, I mean, at this point, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to be a resource. That's interesting. I didn't know you were helping train some activist lawyers. Well, God bless you for that. We need, need more lawyers protecting us activists out here. That's for certain. So uh, if someone wants to reach out to you today, do you have a website or any uh way that you'd like them to email or anything you'd like to be contacted oh, through? My office is probably fine. Um, uh, PaulRichmanLaw.com. Uh, and it, my email is Paul at PaulRichmanLaw.com. My office, 360-392-3911. All right. Well, we will always stand together in solidarity. In solidarity. I, I know. Paul first. I've stolen long ago but uh there are uh, the other pauls out there uh, well i i want to thank you for coming on i've had paul richmond a uh, past portland oregon activist uh, has been up in washington practicing law for the past 20 plus years uh anything you want to say in closing paul thank you very much keep going. All right thank you Thanks for coming on and keep working to restore him <laughs>